Now, I'm old-fashioned. At 82 years old, I have a right to be an old-fashioned. Everybody stand, please, in honor to the word of the Lord. I would like for you to turn to the book of John, chapter, tw- chapter 14, verse number 12. The book of John, please, chapter 14, verse number 12. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, Hallelujah, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Genesis chapter 1. Turn your Bible, please, to the book of Genesis chapter 1. I've often wondered, when people read that, I've read it all my life. I rarely ever see it happen but I've read it my whole life. From time to time, we have seen things that just boggles the mind. But I've often wondered why is it from time to time? And why is it if Jesus said it, why we don't believe it? He said greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Is there anybody who who believes Jesus knows how to lie? then if he doesn't know how to lie, there's a reason he said, you can do it after I go to my Father. In other words, an event that has been a world-shaking event. But how do we get there? Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 said, And God said, let there be light. Verse number 6 And God said, let there be a firmament. Verse 9, And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. Verse 11, And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed. Verse number 14, And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. Verse number 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life. Verse number 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind. Verse number 26, and God said, Let us make man in our image. Verse number 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Verse number 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed. Father, I thank you for the word today. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to come upon the minds and hearts of this audience. May we understand a little clearly, a little more clearly, who we are, and then give us the courage to leave this building today actually acting like we believe it. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. I think it's amazing to me. I've asked so many people over that last couple of years, what kind of language did they speak in the Garden of Eden? I've heard everything. I've heard Hebrew, Syriac, Greek, Italian, Spanish, even English. 
And then I've heard those that say, well, he actually didn't speak audibly. It was in the mind. It's like when you pray and you feel like God's speaking to you, sort of by osmosis. But the fact is, if you know anything at all about the Greek or the Hebrew, you will know that the Hebrew language will tell you that ten times in Genesis chapter 1, when it said, and God said, it was an audible expression. In other words, something that you could hear that God spoke. But the one thing that all ten times had in common, it was a creative language. Because every time he spoke, something was created. Now think about this. If God and his wisdom points us throughout the Old Testament, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but I've said it probably 10,000 times. The New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. And from Genesis to the book of Malachi, it's talking about the day when Jesus is going to arrive. The whole thing, all of the tabernacle, all of Solomon's tabernacle, everything that the prophets said and did, it's all prophetic utterance of the fact that one of these days a Savior is going to come to this earth. And the fact is when he came, the Bible said that he healed everywhere he went, <laughs> miracles everywhere he went. You'll remember the story of the man who sat at this gate or sat alongside of the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. And when Jesus came and asked him, he said, I can't get in the water when it's trouble because there's no man to put me in. Don't you think it's amazing that Jesus didn't trouble the water? He didn't wait for the angel to trouble the water because a lot of people got healed at the pool of Bethesda. An angel would come down periodically and trouble the water, and when it did, whoever got in the water got healed. And the man said, I have no one to put me in the water. Jesus didn't say, I'll put you in the water. Jesus said, Take up your bed and walk. Hallelujah. you got to think about it. This is a different kind of a religion than they're used to. They're used to a religion that, that is the phylacteries on the bottom of the hem of the garment. You're judged by what you gave at an offering. In the tabernacle, I have preached in this church on the tabernacle, I think, a couple of times. And it's amazing to me that people will read about the tabernacle and not recognize that every portion of it is talking about the church and is talking about the Savior of the church, Jesus Christ. Now, you think about this. All through the Old Testament, why did an axe head swim? And why did the thunder roll? And the Bible said the wind came and the fire came when Elijah said, I'm the only one. There's nobody left but me. And the Bible said that a great earthquake came, and that then, then a great wind came, and a fire came, and then there was a still small voice. He said, Elijah, you ain't the only one. I got 7,000 that's never bowed their knee. Folks, you've got to realize this. We may be small in number in this church, but what would this community be like without this church? What would your community be like without you as a child of God? What would your family be like if you did not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Master of your life? You think about this. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. God had a plan, and he had a plan before he ever had a man. And if God had a plan, why do you think these scriptures all point us toward an amazing event? And Jesus nailed it when he said, Greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Greater works than what? He fed 5,000 with five little loaves and two fishes. Hello. Told the man to get up who had been there 38 years and couldn't walk. He opened blinded eyes. He, he went to, he went in the fourth chapter of the book of John, he said it's, it's necessary that I go down to Samaria because there's a woman there that's an outcast. She's a Samaria, Samaritan. She comes to, to draw water at a time when the Jews are not there because she's not welcome. And he said, give me a drink. And she said, do you know who I am? You, a Jew, be it asking me for a drink. And he said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me. And I would give you living water that you would never thirst again. And like most Christian folks, listen to what she said. But you ain't got a bucket. <laughs> How can you do that? 
Listen, folks, it is amazing to me that we look at things based on what we have heard, what we think we know, and we count out what God said, amen, because it doesn't matter what you think, it's what this says. That's what matters. I said it's what this says. That's what matters. And the fact is when Jesus said, greater work than these shall you do because I go to my Father, he meant what he said. But do we do it? Hello, I said, do we do it? Here, here's a man who tells a fisherman who's, who's spent his whole life fishing. And Jesus comes along and said, cast a net on the other side. He said, we've worked all night long, and we've caught nothing. Now, here's a man who's noted to be a carpenter, not a fisherman. How can he tell a fisherman how to fish? Folks, you've got to realize this. It don't matter what they called him. What matters is who he was. I said what mattered is who he was. And as the divine son of God, when he said cast your net on the other side, they recognized there was an authority in his words. And Peter said we've done it all night, but nevertheless, at your word. 253 fishes, so many the nets broke. Folks, if the Bible says greater works than these shall you do because I go to my father, why do we kind of strain at an ad and swallow a camel when there are signs that people come forward for healing, people who have, have needs, and we, we, we hope they'll be healed? We, we just, we, oh, Lord, please. It's amazing to me that I've had 19 coronaries and 8 strokes, or is it 9 strokes? Somewhere down in there. Lost the use of my left arm, lost the feeling in the right side of my face, lost the feeling in my right leg. And I was told by the doctor when I was 62 years old, that I would never feel anything in my leg again. I would never feel anything in the right side of my face again. I couldn't hold a microphone with my left hand. That's why I do it all the time now to tell the devil, you lying sucker, you don't know nothing. Amen. And so I hold a, I hold a microphone on my left hand because the doctor said I couldn't do that. I couldn't hold a cup of coffee, couldn't do anything, couldn't get it this high. But I can tell you this, I'm a believer in what this book says. I said I'm a believer in what this book says. And because I believe it, and all of those times, I've been told seven times by the doctors, if I live 48 hours, that would be a miracle. Well, I believe in miracles because here I am. Amen. And the fact is that that over the anointing of the Holy Ghost, over the years, the anointing of the Holy Ghost has kept us at times when we wondered, How in the world are we going to make it even one more day? How are we going to pay one more bill? How are we going to do? Just this week we had a miracle. We we, we drive that coach out there. And I have learned over the years, if you pull into a garage, uh, that's $500 if they look at it. If they fix it, that's $1,000. If they had to fix it, if it takes more than a couple hours to fix it, that's $2,000. I've been down that road. We have been driving buses for 50 years. And I can tell you, I've been burned again and again. I got burn marks all over my body. Amen. From buses breaking down and going in. And then I, I left it about four years ago. I left my bus at a garage while we were in the British Isles. Some things needed to be fixed. The guy gave me an estimate of $2,300. When I got back, the bill was $7,800. Hello. And he wouldn't let me have the bus back until I paid the bill. Well, yeah, a couple of days ago, I went to a garage. It should have been about five to $600 because they worked on it two full days. Two men most of the time working on it. When it come time, the old boy charged $100. Hello. I said, what? $100. Last year when I was here, the same guy uh, adjusted my brakes. And four or five years ago, he fixed my transmission. The Mexican fellow uh, uh, the other side of town. And uh, he fixed the leak in my transmission. I can't remember how much it was, but I was amazed it wasn't all that much. And he wanted to know all about me. And, and last year when I was here, I had to have my brakes adjusted. Normally, that's a minimum of 100. And uh, and I gave him all CDs because he wanted to know what we do. Do you sing? What do you do? So I gave him all CDs. And uh, when I went to go, I handed the credit card to the lady who was sitting at the counter. And she looked up at the boss and said, how much? And he just grinned real big and he said, how's free? Well, I do. Amen. Listen, listen, folks, you don't know what God will do until you dare to trust him. I said, you don't know what God will do until you dare to trust him. When I read this, you see, the reason I've asked you, or, or I made the statement, rather, I haven't actually asked you the question, uh, what kind of language did God speak in the Garden of Eden? 
The fact was it was a creative language. And the creative language that he spoke in the Garden of Eden obviously carried over until the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis. Did you ever read the story about the Tower of Babel? It will tell you that they fired brick to make them strong. And they made up their mind they were going to build a city and a tower that reached into the heavens. And when they did that, the Bible said God spoke and said, uh, uh, let's go down and see what they're doing. And when he went down and saw what they were doing, he said, unless I confound their language, this is God speaking, unless I confound their language, nothing will be restrained from them. Why is that? It's because they were still speaking the creative heavenly language that they spoke in the Garden of Eden. And because they were speaking a creative language, God himself said, nothing shall be restrained from them if I don't confound their language. And the Bible says he sent them uh, all over the entire earth. Brother and sister, do you ever wonder why there's all different colors? you got to think about this. They may be a lot of different colors of skin, but did you ever notice that the blood is still red? It don't matter what the color of the outside skin is. Blood is still red. Amen. It's because God wanted man to know that it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It's the attitude of your heart. It's the ability to know him as your savior. Amen. And the Bible wants you to have everything that he said you could have. When he said, greater works than these shall ye do because I go to my father, it got my attention. And I started wondering, well, how am I going to do that? Because it all points to after I'm gone. What's going to happen after I'm gone? He said, it's expedient for you that I go away, for the comforter will not come. What did he say he would do in John chapter 14? He said he would bring all things to your remembrance. Amen. He would teach you all things. He would bring all things to your remembrance. And brother and sister, if he's going to teach us all things and he's going to bring all things to our remembrance, you've got to recognize here's something we've got a hold of that we don't understand what it is if you're Pentecostal. I've been in Pentecostal churches that I wouldn't dare preach this kind of a message because most of them are more Baptist and Presbyterian than they are Pentecostal. Hello. Amen. And I can tell you, I, wait, what, if I don't know anything else about the Stovers, they are Pentecostal. I said they are Pentecostal. Amen. If I know anything at all about Danny and Marjorie White, they are Pentecostal. And so I assume that the rest of you, if you ain't Pentecostal, you're mighty close. Amen. And so the fact is that the creative heavenly language that they spoke in the Garden of Eden that God took away from them in the 11th chapter of the book of, of, of Genesis, it is amazing to me that from their own, God had to speak directly. It was him sending angels talking to men all throughout the Old Testament. They had all kinds of sacrifices and things to bring God's presence in. But he said, when the Holy Ghost has come, you will have power. Chapter 1, verse 8 of the book of uh, Acts said, You will have power to jump on one foot and talk in tongues. Amen. You, you, you. I wasn't it? Oh, you'll have, you'll have power to impress the Jehovah Witnesses. Amen. Uh, no, 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 no. He said, I will give you power to be witnesses under Jerusalem. That's home. I met a lot of folks who need to be a witness at home because they ain't a very good one now. Jerusalem and Judea. Judea's next door. I met a lot of folks that didn't even know their next door neighbor. They ain't going to know their next door neighbor. Because I, the dog may bark too loud and I'd like to shoot that stinking dog. Amen. The kids won't shut up. They go out in the backyard and wake me up early in the morning. And I, isn't it amazing to me? Ju Jerusalem, home, Judea next door. And then it says Samaria. That's folks you don't even like. And uttermost parts of the world, that's folks you ain't never met. We take that very seriously. And the reason we take it seriously is because I believe this book. I said, I believe this book. That's why we have been in an area, we've got our side window shot out. We've been bombarded with stones. We've been told one town we went to got a sign outside that said, Protestant to enter Cross McGlynn, do not leave Cross McGlynn alive. And the first time we were there in the high school, I thought maybe that sign might be coming true because they treated us like we were outsiders, that they weren't going to respond in one way. When we'd finish a song, they'd just go, Until about third song, 
Then the anointing of the Holy Ghost came on the scene. And when we closed that assembly, big old boys in the back screaming, Well, what about us? Hey, mister, what about us? Because we didn't get to them because they fiddle fooled around. Well, the second time we were there, it was like homecoming. They were lined up to help us carry the equipment. They fed us coffee and some refreshments. Uh, the teachers wanted to visit with us. We've been there about four times, and now it is like a homecoming. Amen. It's like we've arrived at home when we get there. And at one month, by, by the end of one month after we were there the first time, they started get, the government started getting anonymous phone calls telling them where bodies were buried. I believe it's because the anointing of the Holy Ghost began to touch some lives, whether it was teachers or kids who knew where it was, but they started digging up bodies. And in, uh, in, in a two-month period, over 200 bodies had been dug up that had been killed and hid because they were Protestants. Listen, folks, it doesn't matter where you go. The God you serve can change the atmosphere of where you are. God can change everything because of who you are in Him. And if you realize the fact that when the day of Pentecost came, what did God do? Why all this stuff in Roman, uh, uh, John 7, 37, 38, and 39 said on that last great day of the feast, he stood and cried with a loud voice saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, for out of his belly shall flow rivers of living, Zao, living water. Zao means the highest and the best of the creation. We're going to have living water. What, what is water? You can't live without water. You can't grow a plant without water. You can't drive a car without water. You can't have a bath without water. You can't cook food without water. Brother, he said, out of your belly is going to flow living water. In other words, the words that you speak, I said the words that you speak and the deeds that you do, it's like a fresh stream flowing over dry ground because the reason these kids act like they do when we go to the schools, the anointing of the Holy Ghost distributes living water as we're singing and testifying and they don't know why they scream and holler, they don't know why they want our autograph, they don't know why but I can tell you the anointing of the Holy Ghost still makes a way no matter what kind of a school we're in if it's Protestant or Catholic why is that? It's because we have the anointing of the Holy Holy Ghost. God said that the day of Pentecost came and brother think about this when the day of Pentecost was over a man preached a sermon. The one who denied Christ three times and cursed on the third occasion. The one who took a spear or took a, a sword and cleaved the ear off Malthus the servant of the high priest. The man that Jesus turned to and said get behind me Satan. The man that Jesus said when you're converted strengthen the brethren. The man that couldn't be counted on for anything and yet when the day of Pentecost came and Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost think about this he preached the first sermon that 3,000 was added to the church in, in that third chapter it'll tell you that Peter and John was going into the temple through the gate called Beautiful and there sits a man who's been lame from his birth and Peter came to him and he started asking psalms and our alms and Peter said silver and gold have I none sound like a Pentecostal preacher to me Amen. He said, silver and gold have I none. But first he said, fasten your eyes on me. See, here's the problem with us. Sometimes we believe that God's going to do it, but we, we're also afraid, well, maybe he won't. <laughs> and if you're afraid maybe he won't, what it does is it dampens your faith, and it dampens the faith of those you're praying for. <laughs> Peter did two things, fasten your eyes on me, and then the Bible said he got him by the hand, lifted him up. Hello. You know how many folks I have prayed for in 82 years? 57 years of ministry. I prayed for a lot of folks. How many of them did I see healed? I don't know. Some went away just like they came. But I can tell you in, in, in Morgantown, West Virginia, a little girl came in with the hands that her fingers looked like clubs. Her little finger was bigger than my thumb. They didn't bend at all. But when she left the building, she's doing this. Amen. Fingers had become absolutely normal. Why is that? Because I'm so powerful? No, 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 no. It's because I have been endued with a power from on high that Jesus said was going to come because he went to the Father and because he...
It is amazing to me that the restoration, have you ever noticed this? You ever been to Mexico? Anybody here ever been to Mexico? When they talk in tongues, <coughs> guess what? It sounds exactly the same as it sounds here. We have been to Italy, France, Germany, Ireland, <coughs> Scotland, England. When folks talk in tongues, it sounds exactly the same as it sounds here. Why is that? It's because they got the same thing that we have here. I said it because they got the same thing that we have here. That creative heavenly language, it may sound different no matter where you go. Years ago, thank you, ma'am. I was in a, in a convention the first year I was in the ministry, second year I was in the ministry. And I had a man from uh, named Albert Mink who had ministered in Japan for 30 years. And he was the evening speaker. The place was packed. There was a building about five times, maybe six times the size of this, packed. Albert Mink opened his Bible and read his text. And just as he started to pray, a young Mexican boy, almost at the back of the church, rose up and began to speak in tongues. Sounded strange. And Albert Mink fell on his face, sobbing. Nobody knew what in the world happened. He's supposed to be preaching there. He lays on the floor, sobbing. And finally he got up and he said, I, I apologize. But he said, young man, the young man spoke in tongues. And the guy next to him said, he doesn't understand English. He said, well, has he ever been out of this country? And he said, he ain't never been out of this town. He said, does he know anything about Japanese? And he said, he doesn't speak any English. He, he's only graduated from the third grade, 20-some years old. And Albert Mink fell on his face and started crying again. When he finally got control of himself, he stood up and he said, Folks, I'm so sorry, but that young man spoke in the exact dialect of where I have served for over 30 years. He was home on a one-year sabbatical to raise funds for his missions. And he's booked in churches for a year in the denomination. I can tell you this, he said, the message was clear from the people I serve that I can't do without, we cannot do without you for a year. We need you now. Four days later, Albert Mink was on a plane on his way back to Japan. I never forgot that kind of thing. We had a young lady in our church when we pastored in uh, Mount Washington, Kentucky. They went to an Indian reservation at a big conclave of several tribes who were saved. And uh, with five or six hundred people there, she stood up one night and began to speak in tongues. And the Indians, uh, all of them began to worship God, and the chief, all the chiefs fell down on their knees. And after it was over, they went to her and said, How did you know our ancient language? And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, But nobody knows that language except us. The elders learn it. Even the people don't know it. They know about it, and they knew you were talking in it, but they don't understand what you're saying because they don't speak the ancient language. Only the chiefs speak the ancient language. And you just spoke in our ancient language, and God said to tell us that we are not forgotten. Amen. We are not forgotten. We are still his children, and he's still on the throne for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, the creative heavenly language is capable of, of taking control of your life. I said it's capable of taking control of your life if you're willing to say yes, if you're willing to be a true Pentecostal. I've been in Pentecostal churches for so many years, and I have seen very few Pentecostals. I've seen a lot of folks can jump on one foot. I've seen folks can babble a little bit in tongues. But I can tell you the power that God has divested to the church. I can promise you this. It is more than speaking in tongues. It's more than jumping on one foot. It's more than a little prophecy. It is life transforming. It is nation transforming. Amen. Because Well, amen. I'm praying that that's what will happen to you when you're there. Amen. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. Listen, folks. If Jesus said it, I've heard people say, well, if Jesus said it, I believe it, and it's so. Not true. If Jesus said it, it don't matter whether you believe it or not. 
It's so. Amen. And I ain't finished. I quit. I'll, I'll start it right here. No, I won't leave Miranda's preaching tonight. Everybody stand up. Let me ask you a question. How many folks are, you, you consider yourself Pentecostal? Let me see your hand. How many folks would like to be a whole lot more Pentecostal than you are? Let me see your hand. How many folks would like to be Pentecostal? You'd like for God to take control and give you the power and the authority that comes with the word, comes with the anointing, comes because he said it was so. And if Jesus said greater works than these shall we do because he went to the Father, on a Resurrection Sunday. Why do we celebrate Resurrection? It's because He did what He said He was going to do. He went to the Father. But you see, it's no good unless He rose. I said it's no good unless He rose. His death was useless unless He rose. If He didn't come out of the grave, then none of the things that He said would happen will happen. But because he lives. <laughs> I said because he lives. Why do you think Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Can you? I said, can you? Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus is not alive when Paul said that. How can he say when Christ strengthens me, he's dead? At least he was. But on the third day, <laughs> hallelujah, out of the grave, the, the covenant sealed. And because he lives, I'm going to live also. Because he lives, I am living also. Yes, I want to go to heaven. I'm ready. Anytime the Lord calls, I'm ready. But until he does, I want to live like I'm an anointed, dedicated child of God. What about you? I wonder how many of you here today, you would like more authority and power than you got. Raise your hand. Get out of the seat and come join me. Close, folks. I don't. I don't like. I spit a lot, but I don't like. Get a hold of somebody's hand, would you please? I've been asked before by preachers, not this preacher, but by preachers. Why do you do that? Why do you have people hold hands and have them repeat a prayer after you? Do you know how much authority there is in unity? Do you know how much power there is in unity? Unity will change so much. It is, it's like when you're holding hands, what you're doing is you're drawing power from everybody that's holding hands with you. It's not a matter of you just getting authority and power from the one next to you. No, no. You're getting power from everybody here. And so everybody just bow your heads and close your eyes and repeat after me, please. Lord Jesus, you know me better than I know myself. You know my future better than I know my past. You know what my failures have been. You also know my successes. But better than that, you know what I'm capable of. Anoint me that I can exercise the capabilities 
that you have distributed to me. Help me to understand the authority that I possess. Then give me the courage to act like it. I make a choice today to totally surrender completely without reservation to your will for my life. Anoint me. Make me who I should be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor George Stover, and uh, I want to invite you to come and join with us as we build the kingdom of God at Wellspring Church of All Nations. We're located at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. There's also an entrance off of 4870 Janelle Drive. There is nothing more important to you and I today than the Word of God. If we, if we don't learn as a people, as a nation, to return to the Bible, to return to faith in Jesus Christ and Him and Him alone, we're, we're not going to have the country that we've had, the one that I grew up in. I want my grandchildren and uh, my children, your children and your grandchildren to live in the America I grew up in. But, you know, it's going to depend on us, the people of faith. We have to get into the Word and, and just stick with it. And uh, having done all, stand. And so we're really, really uh, inv wanting you to come and just be a part of who we are, what we're doing here, because it's really all about you.